welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Lauren Marina Perez and I work at the NET. Um, and I'm joined here by Anna from Climate Science Alliance. Hello. Good We're morning. going to get to know a little bit more about Anna in a minute. But right now we have um, just some housekeeping stuff to let you guys be aware of. While we get started here, we are recording this um, and it will be posted to our YouTube page in a couple of weeks. Um, also, your screens are off. We're in a webinar format and you're muted. So if you would like to ask questions, you can do so in the chat function. We'd love for you guys to say hi now. Tell us where you're joining us from. Um, we can get to know who's there. Um, we have Miss Brittany is with us. Um, she's hiding. <laughs> But she's going to be responding to your chats quite a bit. She and I will, um, or if you have any questions or technical difficulties, things like that, throw them in the chat and she will get back to you. Um, and then today we are going to be talking about carnivores and climate change and how those um, two things interact and how they affect each other. Well, how one affects the other, I should say. Oh, I see somebody from uh, Oceanside, Escondido. Awesome. Good morning. Let's see. Anybody else out there? We also have a fun poll for you to take since we are talking about climate change and carnivores. Um, so the poll is up there now. Some folks are viewing it and taking it. Um, which is your local favorite local carnivore? Um, and all of these animals are carn carnivores here. This isn't a trick question. These all eat mainly meat. Um, so we have gray foxes, bobcats, coyotes, mountain lions. We're lucky to have this kind of amazing diversity of, of these beautiful carnivores here. Um, I'm seeing a lot of people saying gray fox, which is cool. I know I've heard a lot about people um, in La Jolla having gray foxes in their backyards right mm -hmm. now or even like a couple months ago spotting them um which is really neat I had no idea that they were just like hanging out in people's yards <laughs> um <laughs> which I would love to see because I love gray foxes too do you have a favorite um local carnivore Anna oh man I, I would have to say coyotes I think mm -hmm. get a little bit of a bad rap sometimes yeah. Um, and I love how adaptable they are and creative. So that's probably right. my favorite. How about you? You know, I, it's so hard to choose, but I'm definitely like a coyote fan mm -hmm. myself. Um, grew up around canyons. And so every now and again, mm -hmm. we'd spot them like in the streets. And yeah, they get a bad rap for people's pets and them, you know, having yeah. confrontations and or unhappy endings. But um but they are really, really important uh, mm -hmm. in our local environment. And we're going to learn a little more about that. Also, they're just so dang smart. Have you, um, okay. like you said, they're adaptable. I don't know if you've seen that picture of the one that's on like public transport. I don't know if it's, in, <laughs> it's on like the BART or maybe somewhere else, but it's just like sitting there <laughs> taking yeah. a ride. Uh huh. <laughs> no big deal. Okay, so I think we can go ahead and get started. I'm going to end the poll, but okay, we have gray fox on top, um, bobcat followed by bobcat, and then coyotes and mountain lions are tied um, for the bottom two spots. So I'm surprised. I kind of thought maybe mountain lion would be number one. I don't know. Yeah, that was my thought process as well, but interesting to see. Loved hearing people's responses. Yeah, so I'm sharing those results now. Um, also, we are streaming live on Facebook to let you know. So if you would like to um, have closed captions as an option, you can select them there on Facebook and watch that way. And that way it'll have closed captioning. Um, and then we're also going to be throwing helpful links in the chat throughout this. So we'd love you guys to check out more of what is offered um, and explore more about local carnivores. As I mentioned, Honest from Climate Science Alliance, they have a ton of amazing resources. Um, so please check out their website. Brittany will share their website um, in the chat now, and we'll also be share sharing it later as well as their Climate Kids resources later in, the, in our program today, because um, it's just tons of cool, cool stuff. And I'm seeing somebody in the chat here saying, um, Elfin Forest, Escondido is where they're attending. <gasps> oh my God, it's Michelle, and they have five coyote pups who play in their front yard every morning and evening. Wow, that is amazing. I need to go to your house. <laughs> I would love to see that. 
Oh, so that's cool. great. Thanks for sharing, Michelle. That's good to hear. <laughs> that's really, really cool. Um, I'm glad to hear they're doing well and they're mm-hmm. so happy and healthy. Um, okay, so let's get, what do you say? Let's get started. Yeah. Shall we? Yeah. Okay. Let's do it. Nice. So thanks so much for joining us today. And I'm excited to learn more about um, carnivores and climate change and how those two things interact. Because honestly, before before uh, getting to, to work with you on this, I really didn't know mm-hmm. um, how yeah. those things were affected and linked to each, with each other. So absolutely. Absolutely. I'm excited to be here with everyone today. Thank you to Lauren and um, the entire NAT team. Um, for helping coordinate this um, discussion around carnivores and climate change and how uh, carnivores in our region are being impacted uh, by climate change. So um, like Lauren was saying, they, we might not um, know right off the top of our heads sometimes how climate change is affecting our region and specifically how it's affecting carnivores and why that even really matters. So I'm gonna give a very light overview of what we're gonna be talking about today, um, just so it can kind of set the scene and um, then we'll get right into it. Uh, During our time today, if you have any questions, um, go ahead and pop them or comments in the respective chat or Q&A box. Um, We will either get to them at the end, Brittany or Lauren might answer them. through the function, the Q&A function, or go ahead and flag it for me, uh, because it's a little bit difficult to keep up with the chat sometimes when I'm presenting. So um, looking forward to any questions, comments, ideas, um, wonderings that you may have about our carnivores. So today we are going to be focusing on um, understanding uh, who carnivores are, Um, their importance in our region and how they're going to be affected and are being affected by climate change alongside human activities. So we're gonna learn, um, it seems like people are pretty familiar um, with some of the carnivores here in Southern California. And then we're going to explore some of the ways that scientists um, track and analyze carnivore movement and how that can tell us more about climate change and help us come up with different plans to help them in the long term. Um, And then at the very, very end, we'll focus on some things that we can do together as a community and as individuals um, to help our earth um, in the face of climate change. So let's get started. If you hear any weird um, clicking like that, it's because I'm figuring out my computer. There we go. So we're gonna start off with a very simple question of what are carnivores? So I believe the chat is still open. So if you guys wanna type in some ideas and if you are on Facebook um, and you're commenting there, unfortunately I can't see those comments um, or questions, but um, they'll hopefully be relayed to me if needed um, throughout our time together today. So Sandy said meat eaters, that's great. Um, If anyone else has any, what else comes to mind is what carnivores are. So, they are meat eaters, absolutely. And they have specialized teeth that allow them um, to eat the certain foods that they do, which is prey and other animals. And they play a really, really special role in the environment. So um, right here, we have three different carnivores. We have our beautiful bobcat here, and then we have our um, gray fox here and then a mountain lion all the way down here at the bottom. So these are a few of our prolific or um, more common uh, carnivores here in Southern California. Though you may not see them, they probably have seen us before. So um, like we said, is carnivores eat meat. They play a really, really important role in um, the food web here. So. They um, help keep prey populations down um, and they eat uh, small mammals, rodents, sometimes birds, um, and that keeps everything within our environment balanced and in check. Um, If anyone wants to throw in the chat box their guess uh, for what type of carnivore they're seeing in this picture, 
This picture was taken um, on a wildlife camera trap. We'll be talking a little bit more about them as we go forward today. But if anyone has an idea of what kind of carnivore is this in this picture, what are we seeing here? Ooh, Donna, nice. Yes, absolutely, bobcat. That is who we are seeing, a friendly bobcat. And going back to my previous question about why carnivores are important, they balance out nature, absolutely. So um, carnivores like our bobcats, they keep a balance within nature and play that really, really special role. Here we go, my mouse is being a little finicky today. Sorry about that. So, um, Again, carnivores eat meat and they control these prey populations. And if they are removed from um, the food web, then we would have an imbalance of um, prey populations that could affect our plants. And then that could affect um, future generations of plants. It could affect um, bird populations, so on and so forth. So another question for you guys, if you can identify uh, what carnivore we're seeing in this picture here. Curious to see, this is this was my favorite carnivore. If you heard that at the very beginning, this is my favorite carnivore pictured. Um, and we're seeing a lot of movement from this carnivore as well. So let's, there we go, there's my mouse. Coyote, yeah, awesome. Yep, this is a coyote. So our coyote friend, um, again, this image was taken on a wildlife camera. So this was not taken by an individual. This was an automatic picture that was taken um, from a uh, motion detected or set off by a motion detected sensor. Such a cool and picture. I know. Yeah. Uh, we wouldn't be able to see the, some of like the way that predators and carnivores have these, um, how they move and where they move and what their behaviors are um, without tools like wildlife camera traps. Cool. So here are many different types of um, carnivores within our region. And so the tie-in between carnivores and climate change is that we're seeing some shifts in the populations and behaviors of these carnivores. We know with climate change, there are being um, certain types of gases that are being released into our atmosphere that um, get stuck and act like a blanket. So it's like a heat trapping blanket and is um, starting to increase our temperatures as many of us have noticed, um, I, at least I think this summer and previous summers as well, um, we've seen, seen increased temperatures um, and that's presented some challenges in ex um, accessing water and other resources that carnivores and um, all of our wildlife need. So um, it can also impact vegetation and that can sometimes lead to more frequent and intense wildfires, especially here um, in Southern California. So scientists study these carnivores so we can better understand the state of the environment and habitat that they live in and then they can indicate um, the health of it. And then from that, we have information um, we can take that information and make plans to help our carnivores in the face of climate change and human activities. So we have human activities um, like uh, building development, um, building different roads, um, even heavily trafficked um, recreation sometimes can impact our carnivores in their movement. And so scientists use different tools in order to track these carnivores and better understand um, how they're being affected by all of these uh, different nuances going on. So one of, the, one of my favorite tools that scientists use is a wildlife camera trap. I'm gonna be super creative and use my little laser pointer mouse. So if you see that um, red dot in the left side of my screen, I'm gonna kind of draw a little bit of a circle right here. This is our wildlife camera trap. And this camera trap um, allows us to take pictures of wildlife while we aren't in the field. And there are a couple advantages to that, um, is that we are able to see things that we wouldn't necessarily be able to see if a person was taking that picture uh, because carnivores can be understandably a bit shy. Um, and we wanna be respectful of their space and the environment. So um, 
we leave those there and um, there we can't be uh, in the field all the time, meaning we can't be outside all the time collecting data. So this is a really great tool that allows us to collect information um, without having to do it necessarily by hand in um, taking pictures by ourselves. So these wildlife cameras use um, a motion detected sensor. So let's say um, you stick out your hand and you wave it. That's some motion, that's a movement. And every time that camera detects motion or movement, it will take a picture. And it's highly beneficial. We can collect a lot of information about their behaviors, um, the frequency that they're moving through an area, so on and so forth. But um, you know what else moves is grass and leaves. And I hear Lauren giggling because I'm sure she's heard a lot about this is um, sometimes we get help from the community through our community scientists. They'll help um, go through these pictures that we get on camera traps. And let's say we have 5,000 pictures, sometimes 4,950 of them are a blade of grass going like this. So it's a little bit of extra work, but it gives incredible amounts of information and shows um, how these carnivores are behaving and moving and maybe some challenges they're facing. Yeah, I love these um, camera traps because I know, I don't know how many people have ever gotten to see a bobcat or a mountain lion, but it's pretty rare <laughs> to come across them when you're out and about. They're mm -hmm. really good at hiding from us, like you mentioned before. Yeah, yeah, they're really good at hiding. And um, probably I, I, as much as I would like to think I would want to be closer to them to get a, <laughs> an up, up close look, it's um, definitely best for, yeah. for keeping distance. So these are awesome, awesome tools. So I wanted to go through a few examples of these camera trap photos cool. um, nice. with friends that are joining us today. So um, I believe our chat is still open but I'm going to draw your attention to this photo and ask a few questions. Um, so we see a carnivore here. I'll give you that hint. Um, what are you noticing about this picture? I'm not looking for a specific answer by any means. So any observation, something that you're noticing about this picture, what's something that stands out to you? So look at the entirety of the picture, what's happening here in the back, um, up here in the front. Maybe some things that are down at the very, very bottom here. Mm -hmm. Donna thinks it looks like focusing on a possible prey. Okay. Donna, what would, what makes you feel like it's focusing on a possible prey? I love that observation. I'm curious. And I know it's kind of hard to type really fast. So, <laughs> all right. Kind of relaxed, natural behavior, maybe by a water source. Donna, the way that the body is positioned. Great. Mm -hmm. Sandy, what makes you think um, that there's a water source nearby? And if you don't have an answer, that's okay. I'm just, I just love hearing people's thought processes. This is the part of science. Um, it's a collaborative process coming up with ideas um, about why uh, animals and carnivores specifically are behaving the way that they are. Blending into shade, ready to pounce. Okay. All right, I'll give it one more second. Any observations, Lauren, that um, you wanted to share? Anything that jumps out to you in this picture? I'm curious. It's kind of that it's up. It seems like it's up high and looking down, mm -hmm. um, maybe down an embankment or a ravine or something. So it kind of has the advantage mm -hmm. as a look, if it is looking at prey, because I mm -hmm. do see what they're saying about like the head positioning and its mm -hmm. muscles. And it kind of has that cat-like stalking yeah. sort of look to it. Yeah. Absolutely. That's great. I think that's a good point to body position, but also the location that it's in, um, you know, so it has, it's a little bit higher because bobcats aren't that big. <laughs> so, um, you know, they have to, they're not only hunting things. Sometimes they can also be hunted. <laughs> so they need to keep themselves protected. Um, and Sandy, I think that's a really great observation that there's a lot of greenery mm. and it looks like um, it, it's pretty dense. So whenever we see yeah. a lot of greenery, that's a good indication um, that there's a water source, whether that's deep underground or if it's on the surface. So very cool. We'll go along to the next one. I could spend so much time on this picture, but I won't. Yeah, it's cool. All, all you can learn from it. Oh, 
This yeah. Is cool. So this one's really, really <laughs> fun. I have one more picture after this, and then we're going to move on to our next topic. Um, really appreciate everyone's comments in the chat, by the way. Um, love all of your ideas and wonderings and noticings. So what are you noticing about this picture? Let's practice um, similar to our last picture, um, looking to what's in the background, maybe what's in the front. Um, do we know what kind of carnivore this is? Does anyone know what it's even doing super curious it's, it's a little say, bit hard to figure out I didn't know carnivores did yoga that's cool to learn yes. yeah yeah <laughs> stretching like they're stretching a little bit yeah looks like a hunting pounce okay so it looks very active mm -hmm. its body looks like it's in uh was captured in motion so again going back to we're tracking these carnivores and their behaviors and their movement to um, help us indicate the health of the environment and if it's being impacted by climate change um, and or human activities. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn on my cool little laser pointer again. I think it's cool. Um, so like Lauren mentioned, um, so right here we have a bobcat, a beautiful bobcat. You can tell because of its speckled belly, you can kind of see its pointed ear right here. I, I have seen these pictures many a time, so it's easier for me to identify. So um, uh, as Lauren mentioned, it looks like our bobcat is almost doing like a downward dog sort of yoga position. Its head and its front paws are down here. Then we have one of its back legs here, the other back leg here, and its tail here. So I will give a little bit of background information is that this image um, was taken uh, as the bobcat took down some prey. So it was most likely a bird. So this is the after effect of that jump. So this is a, again, a really great picture that's telling us, okay, our carnivore is getting some food. That's what we not wanna know is about the health and the movement and behavior of these carnivores. So this is our last one um, is it's a little bit, um, different than using the wildlife camera traps. Those two previous pictures were taken on those wildlife camera traps, but something that I want to draw your eyes to, um, is that this little thing right here, that's an antenna and it is attached to a, um, tracking collar. And so, um, we use both of these tools, tracking collars and wildlife cameras to observe and um, take record of carnivores movement and behaviors. And again, seeing how it's being impacted by climate change and um, human activities. I almost said people activities. Mm -hmm. That still work. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. I love it, successor accessories. Yes. Ooh. So this picture might be a little bit um, confusing what we're doing here, but in order to um, gather this information, this data on our carnivores and putting the tracking collars on them, um, we have to really plan things out and uh, try to capture the bobcats and um, carry uh. the... <laughs> You have to carry the traps and set them in the places you think that the carnivores are going to go. And so they put um, different types of uh, like foliage around it to hide it a little bit, make it a little bit sneakier so the carnivore might feel more comfortable to go into um, the trap. And then this next picture, um, this picture right here is featuring uh, Dr. Megan Jennings. She is a, a conservation ecologist. Um, at SDS, San Diego State University. And um, so what happens here is after we capture the bobcat, we give it um, that sleeping medication, that sedation, so it keeps it really calm. And so then we can put on the collar. And these are specially trained scientists. And here is another um, scientist researcher from um, San Diego State University. And you can see the antenna right here by the gloves. This is a tagged um, and collared bobcat that will help give us information um, so we can plan to better uh, protect and help our carnivores. And just a reminder that these are um, 
specifically trained professionals to do this type of work. Mm. So we want to ensure that we respect wildlife and, um, you know, uh, leave them as they may be. And luckily (laughs) we have trained professionals um, that know how to uh, capture and release our carnivores so we can collect this really, really necessary information. So after they're woken up from their nap, um, we can, we start getting little pings, little dots um, to see where these carnivores have moved around. And again, we're talking about this movement and seeing how maybe these carnivores are um, and their behaviors are being impacted by maybe lack of resources because things are really hot and dry. Um, and they also might be impacted by people. Mm-hmm. So we have four different bobcats in this picture. This is a bird's eye view of um, San Diego, a part of San Diego. And we have one bobcat um, that has, that is represented by the color blue and another one represented by the color green, one represented by yellow and the last by gold. So each of these little dots is a piece of their movement. So I want to draw your eyes specifically to, um, what observations are you making about their movement here? Are we seeing any bobcat movement up here? Are we seeing any bobcat movement over here? Mm. Yeah, they all seem to be really in like a certain kind of almost pathway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It seems that um, they're pretty uh, densely packed. It doesn't seem Mm -hmm. like they're moving um, in a really wide area. It seems like they're kind of stuck. And then it's seeing like, um, it looks like a lot of houses maybe Mm -hmm. or buildings. And then there's kind of like some more, those little fingerlings look like open space Canyon areas, maybe where they Mm -hmm. are located. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So it looks like there's a ton of movement here, like Mm -hmm. Lauren was saying, and we can maybe guess you can see some bit of greenery here that there's probably a, a better amount of water in this area. And one thing I wanted to specifically point out is these yellow lines. These are some of our um, biggest freeways uh, that we have in San Diego is the 15 that goes uh, north and south. And then we have right here in the corner is the five um, that goes north to south. And then we have the 56, which is east to west. And we can see that our bobcats seem to be a little bit stuck and it's really dangerous for them to try and cross any of these huge roadways and um, can impact what resources and competition there may be within this smaller area. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and go to the next picture. So That's why um, scientists have been working really hard to collect this information so we can learn more about how they're being impacted again by climate change, but also come up with some different solutions by creating um, special bridges or tunnels so they can move more safely from one area to another. And here's an example of um, creating one of these uh, safer uh, nature passages. Um, And so we can, from all this information we have, Um, come up with um, different plans in order to maintain connectivity between these, (laughs) maintain connectivity between these two spaces here. Mm -hmm. So you guys are doing great. I'm loving all of the comments that are um, in the chat. I think I believe someone mentioned um, a Canyon most recently, our, That's one of the really great things is that we have um, a fair amount of canyons conserved here in San Diego specifically. Um, So those can exist as wildlife corridors and allows our wildlife to more safely move between spaces um, without human encounters or encountering uh, things built by humans. (laughs) Yeah. So. No, there's definitely roads where I see um sadly roadkill 
but it's mm-hmm. kind of like in generally the same area. You notice that mm-hmm. that's like an area where animals are trying to cross quite a bit and and not and not able to because we're driving right. there. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. And an, another challenge that I've talked just a little bit about, um, but another challenge that our carnivores are facing is climate change. So as I mentioned earlier, is that um, climate change is caused by human activities that are releasing gases um, and things like driving your car or different aerosols, um, things like that. And they get trapped in Earth's atmosphere. So we can, here's our little illustration, getting caught in our atmosphere. And these gases will get trapped there and create a heat trapping blanket around the Earth. And it makes it hotter and hotter Um, and it increases also pollution in the atmosphere itself. And I'm not going to spend too much time on this. I want to get to, we have a little coyote story. Um, So climate change can cause a whole host of impacts from, um, I know some people are familiar with rising sea levels and a lot of what we experience here um, in Southern California is higher temperatures, more heat waves. Um, We can see, um, more droughts and wildfire. So we want to come up with different plans to help both humans and our natural spaces um, and safeguard them from um, the impacts of climate change. So we're back to wildlife cams. And this gives a really good story about um, how carnivores like a coyote can be impacted by um, wildfire. And what are some of the impacts of that and how their, how their lives um, could change moving forward. So, um, and if you can pay attention closely, this is um, our date and time. This is like the first picture of our, our coyote. We're getting to know our coyote friend. And um, going on to our, whoop, there we go is okay so this is october 22nd at about 5 a.m we see our coyote he was out looking for food maybe going for a walk Hmm. but then just a couple hours later we're seeing a big fire come through wow yeah yeah so again these cameras can give us so much information that we might not otherwise have um because um it's not safe for people to be out there um, mm-hmm. during these fire conditions. So luckily we have the technology and tools um, to get this information when needed. It's amazing to see kind of how all encompassing it mm-hmm. is. <laughs> yeah. That's a really yeah, great, background. really great point is that beforehand we're seeing a, quite a bit of foliage, quite a bit of plants. Right. And um, fire, this is our height of the fire around 9.00 AM. And this is what the area looks like nine minutes later. So wow. just as quickly as it came, it was over. Mm. So based on these pictures, does anybody want to give a thought on, hmm, what do we think happened to our coyote, our coyote friend, if this mm. fire came through? I have, I have my hopes, but I have hopes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, it can be intense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because his only option is to run away, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, there's no other yeah. way to get away, or if, or if he wasn't there for any reason. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, hopefully he burrowed. I like that idea. Ooh, Sandy, that's a great question. Might have gotten away. Okay, so I think we're all ready. Ta-da! Thankfully, Yay. our coyote survived, which is great. But we can now see this is um, just a few days after the fire. This is three days after. Um, you know that everything is still scorched, freshly scorched. Nothing has started growing back yet. Mm-hmm. And um, going back to that chat from Sandy, that was a great question. Is mm-hmm. okay. We know our coyote survived, but now what will he eat? He still has to find food and water and shelter for maybe him um, and if they have pups, so on and so forth. So 
This gives a good connection between how climate change, more frequent wildfires, drought um, can be impacting our carnivores. So a good example of this is right here, we are seeing mountain lions drink out of a water guzzler. Um, and I will think <laughs> Laura, Miss Lauren and I chatted about this earlier. Um, <laughs> that one thing to know about mountain lions is they love their space. They need their space. They <laughs> don't often, they aren't often around each other. So mm -hmm. to see them at this watering hole um, or water guzzler so closely um, is gives an indication of maybe some of the stress that they're under. Mm -hmm. And we're just about wrapping up. So I appreciate you guys sticking with us, giving all of your great feedback and ideas. And just to really drive home that reminder that we study these carnivores because they can indicate so much about the health of the region um, and that they play an incredibly important role in our food web. So um, we see that like plants and seeds are eaten by our rabbits which are eaten by our predators. And then excrement or scat, AKA poop is eaten by different bugs and beetles and mixed into the soil and different um, pollinators help our plants reproduce. Um, and so it's all an integrated um, uh, and they rely on one another and our carnivores yeah. play an extremely large role in that. So yeah. to wrap it up and to review, is that um, carnivores are animals that eat meat. They have these specialized teeth that give them the ability to um, tear through the meat and they hunt other animals and have this really important role in the food web and they help control prey populations. But they're being um, impacted by climate change and increased human activities. And thankfully we have scientists and community members that are collecting this information and data to study carnivores and understand how we can help them. So that's the majority of what I have today. Yeah. You guys. Thank but it you. Can be a lot. It yeah. is a lot. It's like, yeah, I mean, it's so, it's amazing to really get to understand this a little bit better, but it also it's hard not to feel a little overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. Like, how can mm -hmm. I help carnivores? What can I do? Um, how can I, you know, help our local environment and then just our global? environment mm -hmm. as well yeah that's a great question and I appreciate the um candidness and sometimes it can be a little scary learning about all of this information um maybe overwhelming and it's like we don't we never want to leave anyone in a place where um they don't feel like they can do something to help um or that we can't work on this together as a community so we can all be a part of the solution and to lift our spirits here's a picture of a bobcat, which I also oh absolutely love. And a reminder that climate kids, and that includes climate adults. So we can all be scientists um, in our own communities. So here are some of uh, some of the wonderful scientists that are within, um, within our network going out and um, being in the lab, being in the field um, that help collect this really important information and information is key to making decisions on how to help, um, our carnivores and, um, our region and the world as a whole. And simply because not all of us are going to be working in a lab or collecting data in the field. Here are some simple, um, things that you can do that have a really big impact. And so I want to draw your attention to here are some 10 things that you can do to help. You can also find this flyer on climatekids.org and would encourage you to um, refer back to it, share it with people, because uh, these are great digestible steps mm -hmm. um, that we can take on and practice in our everyday lives. We really appreciate how you guys put this together for us to try and make it more manageable, mm -hmm. <laughs> easy. It's like 10 things. Okay, we can yeah. all do those things. These are totally... Mm -hmm. totally doable yeah um, and Brittany's putting up the link to these resources in the chat right That's now awesome. thank you yeah. so I'm going to try to pick one on what your climate commitment will be mm -hmm. so if you want to noodle on that to our friends that are joining us today maybe um, pick a climate commitment that stands out to you 
Um, I think one that I always try to do more of um, is eating my veggies. So Mm -hmm. it's good for me. And it's also um, good for our environment, good for our planet. And another one that um, I really appreciate is reading more. Number nine um, is reading more about climate change and sharing what you learn. That's super important um, that we encourage everyone to share their story, their perspective and experiences. Um, So that's really key in sharing uh, these messages and also, again, the things that we can do to help. So if anyone wants to share climate commitment and then we'll wrap up for some questions. Lauren, is there one that came to mind for you? Yeah, well, there are two I think that really resonated Mm. with me. I could definitely ride my bike more. Mm. Um, That's for sure. And uh, planting native plants for Mm. pollinators and then other, you know, that helps all the other animals as well. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Definitely. And I see, I see Sandy saying the same thing, pollinator plants. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. So that's everything that I have um, for our group today. Um, And I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen so we can open it up to some questions. Okay. Yeah. Please, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. Um, We would love to see them. Brittany shared some resources in the chat. I shared a link to an iNaturalist project, which is a community science project for um, California State Roadkill. Sounds kind of morbid, kind of sad, Um, but it really helps scientists track how animals are using the landscape and where they're where they're crossing our roads and and possibly coming into contact with people for the worst. So you can add observations to that. Um, Let's see if we have any questions popping up here. You did such a great job. I I do have a question about Mm -hmm. um, Megan was wearing like the backpack cage Mm -hmm. contraption thing. And how heavy is that? Oh man. Um, it's pretty heavy. I think it's within the realm of around 30 pounds. So imagine if, you know, we're going to set different type of 35 pounds, they can be a little bit awkward to carry around They're They're pretty big. Um, so if we're setting a lot of those traps, um, it can be quite the, the physical experience. Yeah, I lo- I know it's interesting. People always think of like scientists sitting in a lab somewhere, but it's like, yeah, not when you're a biologist, <laughs> ecologist, you're out there, yeah, in the field trekking and hiking, and it's intense. So that's so cool to see her doing that, and I appreciate her, all that hard work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, agreed. And we are getting close to the end here, so we have just a couple more minutes for questions. In the meantime, Anna, I just wanted to say thank you. That was so. Um, really interesting to learn about our carnivores and climate change and just all the work people out there are doing to help them and how we can help those people. So thank you for sharing that. And thank you for sharing Climate Science Alliance resources with us. Um, I really encourage people to go check out the Climate Kids page, even though it says Climate Kids, it's really for, for kids of all ages. There's all sorts of just cool projects on there, resources, crafts, um, artwork, experiment sort of a thing so Mm -hmm. um yeah absolutely thank you so much it's been awesome um getting to share all this information with uh our friends that are joining us today you guys gave so many great ideas and observations in the chat um and that goes back to that this is a um collaborative effort that it can be i know for me sometimes a little intimidating how do i how do, what role do I play in the science world? If, you know, I'm, I'm not like a chemist or a biologist, but right. we can all contribute and help in some way. And like those climate commitments, like saving water, planting native um, plants, all of those things can still help our planet. Um, and it's always so appreciated. Yeah. Awesome. And then um, we, I don't know, you'll be joining us again. Um, in September. So not mm-hmm. next month, but the month after we're going to talk about wildfires and climate change. Um, and then again, in December, you will be back to talk with us about oceans um, yes. and climate change. So I'm really looking forward to those. We're also going to have um, talks 
uh, evening talks for geared more towards adults on those topics as well. Um, so please check out our website and put a link in the chat where you can um, go to our website and see what we're offering. So we're really excited about this partnership and thanks so much for, for joining us and sharing, sharing your wealth of information with us. It's been really great. Absolutely. So. It's been a joy. Awesome. And thanks so much, everybody who joined us. It was really, really fun getting to see your, your insights and your questions. So yeah. have a great uh, weekend, everybody, and take care. And until, until next month, we'll see you then. Bye. Thanks. Everybody.